All right. So hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Excited to be hosting this program for all ages. Although I'm sure a lot of you watching are California fourth graders. Raise your hand if you're a fourth grader. Where are the fourth graders at? Wow, so many of you are fourth graders, over a hundred of you. That's so exciting. I love talking to fourth grade students. If you're not a fourth grader, you're welcome to attend anyways. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Randy and I will be your guide today, coming to you from Columbia State Historic Park. Columbia State Historic Park is the largest preserved gold rush town in California. That makes it very, very special. Um, and today we're gonna be talking about what the economy was like, what the merchant economy was like. So we're going, we're going to be going into some old stores, seeing what would have been for sale back then during the gold rush, seeing how people would pay for things and understanding how the gold rush changed California. So you can see some of the old buildings in Columbia behind me right now, but I wanna know, do you think that before gold was discovered in this area, do you think there were already towns here? I'm going to launch a poll. And you tell me if you think there were already towns here. So I'm launching the poll now. Go ahead and vote. What do you think? Were there already towns up here in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountain range? Okay, the votes are coming in very rapidly very very quickly it looks like a lot of you are saying yes you are you think there were some towns here all right i'm going to end the polling now and i'm going to share the results with you so it looks like most of the audience 150 people think that yes there were already towns here there weren't towns here there weren't actually towns here then the only people who lived up in this region were different native american tribes in particular the Miwok tribe. And then gold was discovered about around two hours away from here. By, it was discovered by James Marshall outside of the city Coloma. Here we're in Colombia. So there's nothing in Colombia either. So that's how town was able to form. And you can see some of town behind me. So let's see how people lived when they first arrived here. So I'm going to turn my camera. Whoops, that's gonna happen a lot because the button to turn the camera is so tiny. It's so small that it's hard for me to, there we go, I got it. Okay, so let's see how people first lived when they arrived here in California. So since there was nothing up here, they would either live in tents or they would live in wooden shacks, like this little shack you see before you. It's just made out of some wooden boards nailed together. You can see the campfire in front of it used for cooking, used for heat. It gets very cold up here. So you cook your meat over the open flame. You would boil your water for coffee over the open flame as well. And let's see how miners lived. So they first arrived, they came up the hills. They came up to the Sierra Nevada foothills with things maybe in a wagon or hauled over their back. And let's look at some of the supplies they would need. This gives you an idea of what we'll see today, what kind of stores you might see. So you can see miners would need lots of tools to dig for gold, things like shovels and pickaxes. We have here a rocker box, um, which was used to separate gold from gravel, a lot faster than just using a gold pan, but we have lots of gold pans as well. Barrels, we have the miner's bed in the back with a blanket for warmth. Over here, we have some miner's clothing hat and a shirt. We have a candle posted up there on the wall for light. It's not a very secure shack, especially when it rains. And then over here we have a variety of food that miners would eat. Mostly things like canned food, dried food, things that can stay preserved for longer. We also have a big rifle used for hunting and a frying pan used for cooking. So that's how miners lived when they first arrived. And then over time, they needed more and more supplies. And so that's how the merchant economy was able to develop here. You could either be a miner or a merchant, store owner. Maybe you wanted to come to California and not look for gold, but to start a business, to be an entrepreneur. Raise your hand if you know what an entrepreneur is. 
Oh, a lot of you do. Now there's some really famous gold rush entrepreneurs. One of those entrepreneurs is someone by the name of Levi Strauss. Raise your hand if you know who Levi Strauss is or what Levi Strauss made. made. Very good. So Levi's are jeans. And Levi Strauss started making those jeans during the gold rush. And miners loved his jeans. So he made a lot of money selling those jeans to miners. There's also a very famous um, chocolate store around San Francisco. It's called Ghirardelli. Has anyone ever had Ghirardelli chocolate? Ghirardelli started during the gold rush as well. They opened their store in San Francisco. So before we move to the main part of town, I wanna to show you some buildings we're not gonna be able to see today, but I'd like to point them out to you anyways. So we have over here a hotel. We have one of two hotels. We're gonna go into the other hotel towards the end of the presentation. This little white building that you see is a newspaper office. And next to the newspaper office, we have what would have been a boarding house. Now, so for miners as they're traveling around, maybe they don't have enough supplies to build themselves a shack or they don't have a tent. Well, depending on how developed the town is, they could either choose to stay in a hotel or a boarding house. Boarding houses, you would just get a blanket, you'd sleep on the floor, lots of other miners, maybe you'd get a cot. In a hotel, you would get your own bed. You'd probably get your own bath and probably a very warm meal as well. So as you can imagine, boarding houses are gonna be a lot less expensive than a hotel room. Most miners, however, though, couldn't afford to stay in hotels, so they would stay in the boarding houses. Okay, so now I'm walking up into the main part of Columbia, and I'm gonna show you where most of the gold was extracted from the ground. So we don't have small little mining um, shafts here or like underground mining, but we have a really large mining pit. So I'm gonna show you this huge mining pit in the distance. You might be able to see what was left over from mining operations here. Can you see some really big rocks or big boulders? Raise your hand if you can see it. Very good. So these huge boulders used to be completely covered in dirt and they were dug out by hand by miners using pickaxes and shovels. These huge boulders go on for miles. A lot of people like to come to Columbia to, to rock climb on them. So they're very, very tall and they were scraped clean as miners were looking for gold. And we didn't bury them back up, but the pit is a lot less deep than it used to be. It used to be a lot more deep than it is today. So all that gold that was found in Columbia, oh, there's a kitty. We have some cats that like to hang out here as well. All that gold was used to create town, the town of Columbia, which used to be one of the five biggest towns in California. Today, we only have about one or about three blocks of old buildings, about 30 buildings in total. But Columbia used to be much, much larger than it is today. So I want you to think about in the 170 years since the gold rush, what do you think happened to most of those buildings? Raise your hand if you think they were destroyed by something. All right, so a lot of you think that, raise your hand if you think they might have been destroyed by fire. Very good, yep. So some big fires destroyed Columbia. We had two really massive fires. They were also destroyed by something else. They were also destroyed by mining. So as gold became harder and harder to find, most of the buildings that used to exist here and all the blank space that you see, those buildings were torn down so miners could mine underneath them. So it's too bad. It's too bad we don't have more of Columbia left, but we're grateful for what we do have. Okay, so let's get started checking out what the economy was like. So with this first building right here, this is the Wells Fargo building. It's two stories. The top floor is part of a home and the bottom floor back then was more like a post office. So miners would wait here in a line, a long line, and they would drop off their gold to be weighed. And they would also see if they had any packages or letters from home. Now there's a very important business located 
right behind the Wells Fargo in what we call the assay office. Now I'm gonna give you a warning. When I start entering some of these brick buildings, you can see these buildings are really thick brick. So sometimes my signal is gonna get a little fuzzy, could get a little glitchy, and it's not my fault. It's just that the buildings are so, they're made out of such solid brick. So my signal might get a little glitchy when I go in. Don't worry about it, we're just gonna go with it. All right, so over here, as I mentioned to you, something called the assay office. And this is where gold would be tested for purity. This is where gold would be melted down, poured into molds and made into gold bars. And this is where they would use different chemicals like mercury. And the after they money. You can imagine it was a pretty high paying job. So that's one of the jobs that would be available back then in the economy. And now let's go inside the two story Wells Fargo. And you can see the buildings in town. So this particular building was built in 1857. But the buildings have these um, really tall metal doors or iron doors. And those doors are there to protect from what? Think about that. Raise your hand if you think they're there to protect from birds. Raise your hand if you think they're there to protect from fire. Remember I said fire was a big danger. Very good. So these are fire protection doors. They also do protect from um, being broken into as well. But their main purpose was to protect from fire since fire was so common. Okay, I'm gonna get out my key and we're gonna go ahead and enter into the Wells Fargo. Remember, my signal might get a little fuzzy. Okay. So this is the parlor, the back area, the parlor room of the Wells Fargo. And this was used as a home, like I mentioned. So the top floor is used as uh, bedrooms and this space was used as a living room. And the person who lived here, the people who lived here, starting in around 1857, were the men who owned the Wells Fargo, who um, were the Wells Fargo agents. So they oversaw all the operations here. They're kind of like the Wells Fargo manager. First of them that we had was a man by the name of William Dagner, and he immigrated here from Germany. So different immigrants would set up their own businesses. And a lot of times I get students or anyone who asks me, will you go upstairs? I'm gonna let you in on a secret. I don't like to go upstairs. The upstairs portion of the Wells Fargo is a little scary. There's no real electricity and the staircase is very, very steep and there's nothing up there. So I don't really like it. Nothing to see. Don't feel like you're missing out on anything. I mean, not going up there. All right, so that's the back portion. The front portion is the Wells Fargo office. So this is where each day, William Dagner and the other Wells Fargo agents who owned the Wells Fargo after him, who oversaw operations after he left, would accommodate the needs of miners who showed up, miners and merchants, townspeople. So if you're turning in your gold, your gold's going to be weighed on a scale that looks like this. Maybe you came here to see if you had any mail arrive to you. So they would distribute the packages, the mail. Over here, we have the desk with the feather quills. Up on the wall, you can see the lettering. Back then, buildings would be heated with stoves. They would be pretty hot, so you wouldn't want to touch it with your bare hand. And then over here, if you can see some of that exposed brick. Old, really, really old brick in the wall. And then we have the safe, which was imported from Boston. I'll show you inside this safe really briefly. It's fireproof, which is good. Remember I talked to you about fire hazard. So that's the Wells Fargo. So after a long day, probably dealing with a lot of angry miners and angry merchants, the Wells Fargo agent could take a couple steps and he'd be in his home. And then another interesting feature about some of these old buildings is that they have um, like a trap door in the wall and that leads to what's called a root cellar. And that's where food would be kept and food would be stored. All right, next door to this building, 
we have a little entryway to the next building, which in here is the office. So I'm about two and a half hours away from San Francisco, about an hour and a half away from Sacramento. If you wanted to go to, to either of those two towns, you'd come in here, book your ticket for the stagecoach, and you'd wait for the stagecoach to arrive. Stagecoach will look like this, pulled by horses. You can see how you would pack your belongings. So your belongings would be packed into trunks, like this merchant trunk. Show you this trunk over here. This is a ladies trunk. And then lastly, I'm gonna show you what the little stagecoach would look like. So all of your trunks would go up at the top. Passengers would go through here, sit on some benches, be pulled by horses, be a pretty bumpy ride. Also pretty tight quarters, quarters to squeeze into. So you'd probably feel really hot. Um, the stagecoach is going to be, stagecoach driver's gonna sit right there. Have you seen it in shotgun? Raise your hand if you've heard that term shotgun before. All right, a lot of you have. So that term comes from this era. And that term means that the person sitting shotgun would actually have a rifle. And they would protect from stagecoach bandits. Some robberies did happen. Um, so in addition to passengers and mail being transported by stagecoach, Gold would also be transported by stagecoach. Remember I told you gold is melted down into gold bars. And those gold bars would be put in a locker box that looks like this. And that's how they would be shipped. All right, so that is the stage office. A lot of rules too, if you're taking the stagecoach. If you're taking the stagecoach, you cannot, one of the actual rules is that you cannot accidentally um, fire off your gun in the stagecoach. I don't know why they, I guess a lot of passengers were doing that, but they said that if you fire off your gun, you could scare the horses. That seems like an obvious rule. You could also kill another passenger, um, but that's one of the official rules back then if you wanted to have the privilege of riding on the stagecoach. All right, we're gonna go back into the parlor and then we're gonna exit the parlor and go back onto the main street here. Okay. Shut the door behind me. I'll shut the fire door of it too. Okay, and then let's continue on our tour. All right, so we got to see where the Wells Fargo agent worked. That was a very pres prestigious job. Um, and it was pretty high paying as well. Very important role in town. A lot of people relied on you. You can see across the street, we have a building built around 1890. So a little bit after the gold rush. And now we're gonna go ahead and step inside of the bank. And this bank at one point used to be considered the most beautiful building in all of Colombia. You can see that the gutter in front of it is made out of Colombia marble and there's marble steps as well. The building was at one point painted white. So let's go see what the bank would have been like. You can imagine with all the people finding a lot of gold, they want to find somewhere to put it in a bank. So many different banks in town. All right. So this is the bank. Some of the things that we have in this bank, and this building's usually closed. You can see this very old safe. See the counter where the customers sit and wait to be helped. And then over there in that corner, you can see another safe. That one's pretty safe. It's behind some of those fire so that is the bank. You could also be a banker back then as well. And let's continue on our tour. So I like to mention to students and to anyone, to all our guests, 
how large Columbia was. So it had about around 150 businesses. In comparison today, we only have about 30. So we've obviously shrunk a lot over time. And as the gold played out, town started to dwindle, population of people left, town became smaller and smaller. Over here we have the saloon, the Douglas Saloon. Um, there are many saloons in town. Out of 150 businesses, around 30 of those businesses were saloons. Saloons were where miners went to socialize with one another, played card games, a lot of them made horrible decisions, lost their gold, maybe got in a lot of fights. So that is the saloon. Next to the saloon, we have the justice court. And I'll show you inside the justice court. So let me go ahead and open this. There's so many keys. So give me just a second. Okay, so here's the little justice court that we have. Open, opening the door for you now. So here we go. You can see where the judge will sit, judge's gavel. Um, a flag on the wall with only 31 stars representing how California was the 31st state. You can see where the person on trial, on stand would sit. Maybe it was someone, a witness to the crime. And then over here, we have another desk. Candle stick for light and some examples of some letters. These letters would be sealed with wax. So that's the small little courtyard, or I'm sorry, courtroom. And now let's, oh, I'm now I'm gonna show you my favorite building of all. The oldest building in Columbia, which some I think would be the Wells Fargo, since it's two stories. Nope, the oldest building of all is this building right here. This building survived two fires and was built in 1854. So it's technically the oldest building in Columbia. If you compare this building, this is called the Clementine Building, and it used to be used as a general store. Now compare this building to the buildings next to it on the same block. Raise your hand if you notice some differences. See anything different between them? Can you tell that they weren't all built at the same time? Very good, so a lot of you can. You can tell some differences that this one's older. Um, the doors are wider. The top isn't as decorative as the other buildings. Flatter, the roof looks different as well. But this building has an interesting secret to it. We can tell what's interesting about it when we look at the side of it. So this white building is a house. It's called the Tibbetts House. It's right up against the Clementine Building. And if you notice, this building is only one wall. So there's no other walls. So it's not a full building anymore. So all we have left of the oldest building in Columbia is just one wall. So the inside's fully open and exposed. So it's really important to protect this one wall since it's technically the oldest wall in town of all the buildings. All right, let's continue on our tour. Across the street, you'll notice another business. It's probably familiar to you. This is the barber shop. So there'd be barber shops back then to get your hair cut at, to get your beards trimmed. Town society was mostly male. You'd also go here to take a bath. So a bathtub would be set up. Miners would take turns using the bath. So they would be using the same dirty bath water. Pretty disgusting. There's another two-story building that I've actually never been to the top floor of. That's a separate key that I don't actually have. So even though I've worked here over a year now, there's some buildings I've never been into. Don't have access to all of them. Some of them take really old like skeleton keys. We're gonna go into this little building right now, tiny little brick one, and talk about the importance of this store. So I'm gonna go enter in through the store from the back. And as I do this, I'm going to share with you a photo of 
a merchant, a Columbia merchant. So you're looking at a photo of an unknown Chinese merchant. So we don't know this man's name, but we know one of the businesses here. So we're gonna be talking about the Chinese population of Colombia. All right, so I'm getting into the building now and I'm going to stop sharing it. And we're gonna enter into this store. And this is the Chinese store, which it's really special that I'm able to take you in here because normally all the guests of Columbia, the people who visit, they can only look inside this exhibit. We're actually able to stand in it. Get a closer look at some of the things in here. So over here we have um, an altar used for praying. They would light incense, some oranges there. There is an herb cutting table. You can see like a big hatchet. On the wall, we have herbs and teas imported from China, teapots, cultural objects from China, things that were brought over, important aspects of their livelihood and their identity. See a scale here used to weigh herbs. There's different medicinal uses. So you can see some shells, um, sea horse shells or seahorses and a turtle shell. And those would be grinded up and made into a powder to alleviate some pain. See over here as well, different oils, stove. They were didn't mine anymore. And instead of going back to China and leaving California permanently, many of them decided to become merchants instead. So I wanna ask you, do you think miners made more money than merchants during the gold rush? I wanna know what you think. I'm gonna launch a poll right now. Do you think miners made more money than merchants during the gold rush? The poll might take a second to reach you. It's a little delayed. I'm gonna blame the signal in the building. What do you think? Is that true or false? Did miners make more money? All right, I'm gonna give you about five more seconds to get your votes in. Five, four, three, two, and one. I'm gonna end the poll. Let's see what most of you think. I'm gonna share the results. So overwhelming majority, 70% of you think that that is false. Miners did not make more money. You are absolutely right. It was the merchants who made more money. So very good job. So smarter to be a merchant than to be a miner. Now, as I exit out of this um, building, I'm gonna share another photo with you. And this photo is of old Columbia. I love this photo so much because you can really understand how large town was. So if you look, I mean, all we really have left of historic Columbia is just one street, a couple blocks. But look how large Columbia was then. It was a huge town. And you can notice there's a couple standing in the photo. You have your look down on the street below. So it's sad to remember that most of those buildings that you see there, they no longer exist. They're gone, torn down intentionally to mine or they were destroyed in fire or just through time since they were mostly wooden. So that's what old Columbia used to look, look like. You can see how large it was, what a big town it was. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing that now. Check out a few more businesses. We talk about the economy. Across the street, we have a blacksmith shop. It's where you'd go to get your tools sharpened. Maybe a repair to your gold pan if your gold pan had a hole in it, instead of buying a brand new one, which could cost you hundreds of dollars. We have a restaurant. Back when town was very large and very diverse, there were French restaurants, Chinese restaurants, French grocery stores. 
So each culture brought with them some of their traditions from home, whether that be their food or their religion or their clothing. Then over here we have a livery stable. And this is where you would go if you didn't have a horse. So you can come here, you can rent a horse. Maybe you could come here to buy a horse or trade your horse. Now, there's a funny story with this building though. This building is not an original building from the gold rush. This building was remade in the 1980s. This was built and it was built for a TV show, but we kept it up because we didn't have a livery stable. So it's actually a movie prop. As far as I know, this is the only building that was built as a prop. Okay, now let's come head into the livery stable where you'll see carriages. So no more horses today. We have a variety of different carriages here. Used for transportation. So you can see we have a day carriage, roundabout wagons, which were pretty fast with big tires to turn tight corners in town. And then we have a supply wagon. Right behind me, we have a hearse used for funerals. And these hearses were decorated with big colorful feathers. That was very in style back then. So the funeral procession would go through town here. Now, I'm gonna ask you a true or false question. I'm gonna go ahead and launch it. Just a second, let's see. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and ask you the question now. Let's see, what do I wanna ask you? Oh, most people could afford carriages. Launching the poll now. Most people could afford to buy a carriage. What do you think? Votes are coming in so quickly. Over 240 votes. Okay, I'm gonna end it in five, four, three, two, one. Let's see, I'm gonna share the results with all of you. So overwhelming majority with 84%, 233 people think that's absolutely false. And you are exactly correct. Most people could not afford a carriage. It was really a luxury, really just owned by um, the upper class, upper class Columbia citizens. So instead of getting around by wagon or carriage, most people would just plain old fashioned walk. Or they could also maybe rent a horse or take the stagecoach, but definitely not those carriages. And if you can imagine, like you saw in the photo that we saw of Columbia, streets weren't paved, they were just dirt roads. So you'd have some carriages and wagons. That's why we have this boardwalk here. So you'd use the boardwalk rather than walk in the main, main street where you get dirty and muddy. All right. Keeping on our tour, we're gonna go ahead now and go into the hotel. City hotel here. See what a hotel looks like inside. All right. Remember, hotels would cost more money. So here we're standing in the hotel. And what I really like about this hotel is that you can see this old, what's called a lithograph, all these drawings of the old buildings that used to be found in Columbia. Only a few of these buildings still remain. We actually went into one. We went into the bank. The bank is right there, the Mills building. Here's the bank that we went into. But most of the buildings on the no longer exist, sadly. All right, let's go ahead and head upstairs in the hotel. So hotels would have an area for dining and then the guests would stay upstairs. Now this staircase is a lot less scary than the Wells Fargo staircase. So I don't mind going on the second floor here. 
All right. So up here we have a big landing room, a room where you could socialize with the other hotel guests. There's also a poker table. Remember card games are very popular. And what I really like about this hotel is that this hotel has balconies. You can see Columbia below from the second floor. We also have, if these are open. Nope, they lock the hotel rooms, dang it. But at least we can see where the guests would socialize with each other. Some of the old antique furniture. So you can imagine, pretty expensive to stay in a hotel. And now we'll head back on the main street and we're gonna go ahead and get ready for a final stop, which is gonna be a general store. First, I have some other things to show you. So that is the hotel. Remember how I told you the difference between a hotel and a boarding house. Boarding houses are cheaper. You just get a blanket, maybe a cot. All right, so back on the main street here. Now we only have two homes still left on Main Street in Columbia. This house that you're about to see is the Wilson house, which was used in a movie, an old Western movie called High Noon. So different TV shows and films use Columbia as like a backdrop. And so this home was built by a family that owned the building next door, and this was their shoe store. So businesses like general stores existed, shoe stores existed, some clothing stores existed, a variety of different businesses. Right next door, we have a big firehouse. And our final stop's going to be this little wooden store right at the very edge of town. This store um, survived fire because it was built around, I want to say around 1870. So after the gold rush had ended. If it had been built during the gold rush, it probably would no longer exist. Right in front of it, we have a Conestoga wagon, the type of wagon people came to California in, or covered wagon. And let's go inside the general store, see what items would have been for sale. There'd be many different general stores. They're kind of like the Walmart of the era and I'll show you my favorite thing in this whole park. You can probably already tell what these are. So we have a chicken coop here and these chickens are called Dominique chickens and they were the most popular type of chicken to have, most popular chicken breed to have during the gold rush. The girls, the hens, are known for being pretty sweet, very docile. The rooster has more of a temper. You can see the rooster right there. Very, very large. The chickens are an important part of Columbia's story as well. And chicken eggs alone, even if you had a chicken back then, you could sell the eggs for around $2 per egg. So eggs were in high demand. Not a lot of people own chickens, so you can make a fortune Chicken, having a chicken was like a little gold mine. All right, let's go inside the store. This will be our last stop. Right across the street, you can see a grocery store. This was a French grocery store. So technically I'm standing on the French part of town. Down the road some more is the Chinese section of town. So the different cultures um, could be found in different sections of town, just like today as well, in different and large cities. A lot of the towns are divided. Columbia was a large town, so it was divided as well. And I'm going to take us inside the general store here. So here you can see the different types of items that would have been brought up in big wagons and put on sale for miners. There's no prices in this store because it was basically you had to barter. Some days, something like coffee 
would go for a really high price. That just meant it was more in demand. So merchants really had the power. Like we talked about earlier, merchants would make more money than miners back then. See this cash register. So some of the items for sale, things like dishware, canned food, coffee, canned peppers, lots of fabric, pans, toothpaste, basically tooth powder. We have nails in case you need to do repair to the, repairs to the mining shack. Feather quills for writing. Over here we have soap, hardtack, a cracker, and some apples. Now, just like in the Wells Fargo, the merchants back then would typically live inside their stores. So back here we have the merchant's house. See the bed, the stand, there's the pantry, the bathtub. So luckily this merchant didn't have to go to the barbershop. Over here we have the dining table. Those are not real carrots and those are not real apples. I get asked that a lot. And then we have the stove. So that's an example of the general store merchant's life. You can see probably not as glamorous as the Wells Fargo agent, didn't make as much money. And then over here I have a little Columbia that newspaper. So you can see what newspapers would look like back then. Then they would have on the back a list of all the prices, wines and liquors and sugars, cigars and tobaccos and candy. So the prices would be listed and the newspaper would be printed every day. And this was the Columbia Gazette newspaper. You can see the date on it, December 1st, 1853. All right, so with that said, I'm going to conclude today's presentation from Columbia about the Columbia Let me turn my camera. I want to officially say goodbye to you in person so you don't have to just stare at a stove. Give me a second, hopefully I can get it. All right, everyone. So thank you so much for joining me today at Columbia. Um, bye everyone. Check out more home learning programs as well. Bye to all the fourth graders. I know I had a ton of fourth graders watching. Thank you for joining me today.